and uh, very uh, eminent speaker in the field of the GI. Our cases for today are going to be about uh, GI malignancies and sarcoma. I'll be chairing this session with my colleague, Dr. Mohammed Al Girni. Dr. Mohammed is a consultant of other medical, medical oncology at uh, King Abdelaziz Medical City, uh, National Guard Riyadh. And he will be listening um, to Dr. Kanaan and Dr. Ashwak. And both of them are consultant at National Guard Riyadh. The first case will be presented by Dr. Ashwag. It is about uh, pancreatic cancer. And I'm 100% sure that you're going to listen to very challenging and interesting case. Dr. Ashwag, please. Uh, before please. starting, uh, Dr. Ashwag, uh, just a small correction. Uh, actually, uh, it's our pleasure oh. to have Dr. Mohammed Al Ghamdi with us uh, today. He's going to share, share the uh, session with uh, Dr. Uh, Anafisa, Dr. Mohammed Al Ghamdi, he's a dear friend and colleague, and he is the uh, head of the medical oncology unit at King Khalid University Hospital and a consultant uh, medical oncologist. Uh, welcome, uh, um, Thank you so sorry, much sir, for having me, guys. Sorry, Dr. Mohammed, I'm very it's sorry. It's my pleasure. Welcome to our meeting. Thank you. Um, we we'll bring Mohammed to ask a difficult question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> be ready for that. <laughs> So thank you, uh, Nafisa. Thank you both, Mohammed, um, both um, uh, my friends and my colleague. Uh, maybe I'm younger, but they are my colleague. Anyway, we'll start our first case. Um, the first case is about pancreatic cancer. Can you see my slides? You see my slides? Yes. yes. Come on. So we'll start. Um, Mohammed, he knows this case very well. Uh, this is a 52-year-old uh, patient present with abdominal pain and weight loss, an MRI done in Feb 2012. I think both of you are in the college, right? MRI finding um, show pancreatic carcinoma with um, sign of double duct, sign and cholangitis, and he was planned for pill in March 2012. When they went and they find a liver lesion, and during the surgery, they uh, did a section and sent for frozen section and turned to be metastatic adenocarcinoma of pancreatic primary. So the patient, the surgery was supported and the patient was sent to medical oncology as this is metastatic pancreatic cancer. So I saw the patient, he's diabetic hypertensive with dyslipidemia. Started in 2012, we have only cis gem, uh, based on the ABC clinical trial and was starting chemotherapy. Uh, uh, I could not show the CT scan because it's outdated. So it's not even in the new system. So in the CT, there is no hepatic lesion, atrophic pancreas. So I've discussed him in the tumor report six times. Every surgeon in the hospital refused to take the patient based that he is metastatic. Patient received 17 cycle of chemo against cysts and uh, gem with good tolerance. In 2012, we were fortunate to have one of our surgical oncologists joining, just joining from the state, and he agreed to do um, the Whipple. So the discussion came to me with a patient that we know this is not a curative surgery. We know that we're treating metastatic pancreatic cancer. So I'm not giving the patient all the hope that this is, will be a straightforward Whipple and he will be out of the wood. So I gave him the two options. So being chemotherapy, till a one stage that he will progress. And at that time, we don't have any further option and he will end up with supportive care or to go to surgery, which is a huge surgery, um, given the fact he's not young, but he had um, a, lot, a lot of comorbidity. He'd been heavily pretreated with chemotherapy. So the surgery carrying a big risk. So the patient agree, knowing that this is the only option and the option doesn't mean cure because at that time we lack any data that metastatectomy will work in pancreatic cancer. So they went there, they resect the cancer, turned to be small 2.5 lesion with moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma. All margin was very clear. We were suspecting two lymph nodes were positive on the scan was large and turned to be only um, infected lymph node. So no tumor in the lymph node. So 50 lymph nodes were negative. So post-op, I gave the patient Jumzar as an adjuvant, and um, I think that there will be too many questions about that. But honestly, I was trying to um, 
make the surgery as a success to eliminate any microscopic disease, although there is no data of supporting that and having the patient receive 16 cycle of Zimzar would be any help. Um, so that um, I treat him as just patient has uh, freshly had Whipple, never receive um, chemo pre-op. On the follow-up, which is, that's very important uh, for a teaching point of view. So the patient have the surgery in March. And again, if you look at June, his uh, CA199 jumped to 77. At that time, we were doing a serial CT scan. And again, jump again when we repeat it to 138 drop to 7040s on middle of uh, 2014 and in July of 2014 it's reached 194 so that's a big jump at that time we did for him a PET scan and trying to be negative and again it's dropped by itself we did not commit him in any kind of therapy because only the CAA was the, that trending up and down and we don't have any reason for this so the learning point um, the patient seen, I think, um, 20, end of 2020, and still cancer-free. So the question now, can we treat um, stage four pancreatic cancer? So this is um, data, it's uh, fresh, like 2008, 2019. This is showing you a survival for a patient in a pilot study in a small number of patients, that group of patients have metastatectomy with oligomet, they do survive. Although the number of the survival here is was not huge, uh, looking at the fact that this is like late in 2015 and our patient almost like nine year survival, um, very encouraging. And this is again, um, another case of patient have resection of metastatic disease in pancreatic cancer, and it did in fact contribute to survival. And it's it's um, it's, it's it's also it was a solitary lung and liver. And again, the patient have eight year survival after resection. This is um, an, um I think this is a similar at the previous one. So this is the first learning point that still we can cure stage four pancreatic cancer. Rule of radiation. Now, when we talk about this patient, we were exploring all option and the post-operative or even in the pre-operative se setting. Having, the, um, we know the rule of radiation and pancreatic cancer, it's have a lot of debate even in the new adjuvant setting and in the adjuvant setting when you have a positive margin. Some data was talking about having positive lymph node, maybe radiation will help, although this is a systemic disease rather than, um, uh, rather than a localized disease. So radiation on a node positive, I think it's a weak point, but there is a data supporting that. But in our patient in particular, if we don't have a positive margin, I don't think there is any rule of post operative radiation or preoperative radiation. Third question, giving the patient post-operative chemotherapy, would that um, have an effective rule in his um, cure or that can um, um, add value to the surgery that was done to the patient? Again, um, on patient with metastatic disease and post-resection and giving the fact that patient was treated for more than a year with chemotherapy, it's no clear answer, um, but if your patients are fed and um, the chemotherapy and cytobine have low toxicity profile compared with cisplatin, a patient at one stage, he starts to develop some neuropathy because of cisplatin. Again, um, giving uh, chemotherapy post-op after a heavily pretreated, um, if um, the time coming back, maybe I would not give him any further treatment and just gonna watch the patient. A third question, how sensitive our CA99? Looking at our patient, for me, uh, make me not to trust the CA99 really in following up the patient except for metastatic disease, which can reflect the efficacy of therapy or it can predict an early, um, early recurrence on this patient or progression. But the data, of the, uh, for the CA99 that it show um, around 90% sensitivity and 83% specificity. So it is sensitive. Um, I would continue follow the patient who are going CA99. 
but is that something will uh, encourage me to start therapy without having any detectable disease? Probably the answer is no. So last slide, do not, give, uh, do not ever give up on your patient and thank you. Thank you so much, Ashwag. That's, a, that's an impressive case, actually. And I need to be honest with you, you always present these challenging and beautiful outcome cases. Thank and you, I Hannah. congratulate you on, on the great job. Um, um, to be honest, th this is not a, the usual cases. And I can't really remember uh, a patient who passed two years uh, with metastatic disease. Uh, but that, that just tells you um, cancer will de declare itself and it will show itself and i would do the same as you did uh, if this patient got the complete response after a few cycles of chemotherapy and you kept going with the chemotherapy that's probably the patient that you would like to send to a surgeon and that's why there is a huge interest now to introduce the new adjuvant and curative setting to see these patients who are gonna respond and might benefit from surgery for versus those who might actually progress because we see some patients. Um, if you look at the data, all cameras, all pancreatic cancer cameras with metastatic disease, there are less than 5% who can be alive at five years. This is probably one of these patients. So that's an excellent case. Um, we're gonna open now the floor for uh, questions and discussions, uh, but very interesting. Um, I have to add to this, Mohammed, and I have a 90 year old who had um, work built. Uh, then we gave her adjuvant. And um, after a year, she developed one single lung mix. And we did resect that, but this lady did not survive uh, because she had the recurrence again and again and again. But she survived for almost five years in a 90 year old. So right. it's even prolonged the survival, even if we did not cure this patient. Uh, but this is unique cases, and I think the patient should take individually because as us, like an oncologist, when seeping keratic cancer metastatic, that's it. It's a palliative, and even the discussion with the family was different. Um, and um, this guy, I was so happy that seeing him in the clinic, I sent him to the survival clinic, then I bring him back to my clinic because it's good to see these cases because it gives you Absolutely. Joy. Yeah. Absolutely. Did you do a, at any point pathology review? No. We don't have that fancy at that age, but uh, maybe now, but it will be like, I don't know about the, the specimen now, if it is I mean, good enough. Sometimes you can have like, I don't know, but like a neuroendocrine tumor, low grade. This is a behavior of a low, low grade in, in neuroendocrine tumor, right? So if, but we have two pathology. But you have a two pathology, right. So the biopsy as well as the surgical pathology. And the, the surgeon, part, yeah. yeah, the surgeon did a good job. Instead of taking a biopsy, he widget. So the, the one who attempted the first Whipple, he did a good job. Absolutely, absolutely. Impressive, well, it's, amazing. It's so now uh, let's, let's hear from the Dr. Anafisa. Yeah, is he, first question, is it the same patient that I saw like three years ago and I told you he's having very high CA99 and I think he's having disease recurrence and you just shouted on my face and you said, no, is he the same? <laughs> yes. Okay. Can you order a bit scan. Yes, I did. I did. <laughs> the other question, do you think other factors contribute on this outcome, like his performance, uh, tumor profile? Uh, do, we, we, do we need to look at those patients differently, like seeing other associated factors that might participate in a good outcome of patient having a stage four pancreatic cancer? I think and that's and what- Another word, Ashwag, beside the great oncologist. Yes, okay. Yes, on top of that. <laughs> Um, I, 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 I think I agree. Um, maybe if we can look, if we, I'm planning to, uh, to write it as a case report. Uh, maybe it will be good to dive more on the pathology of this patient and look. Yeah. Definitely his biology is, is good because he responded nicely. Uh, he did well and he did not have a recurrence, which is, um, I think that will make him unique. If you allow me, Mohammed, I have a comment. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think uh, every one of us has seen this patient at one stage. Uh, I saw him <laughs> when I was uh, fellow first year. But if we look to things yani, backward, uh, 
I think now we have better understanding about patient pancreatic cancer who might respond to chemotherapy, especially this patient received platinum-based uh, chemotherapy, cisplatinum gemcitabine. So now there is a growing interest in the homologous recombination pathway in patients with pancreatic cancer that indicate BRCA and other genes that can make the patient, you know, uh, respond better to platinum-based chemotherapy. So this is one of the explanation that would explain the uh, the uh, better response that this patient uh, has. And good job, uh, Shwab. Excellent. So I have a question here from the audience. So if you got the same case in July 2021, how would you manage it today? I'll send it to Lgagni. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd probably what? start with Nox, right? And yeah, you just definitely. follow I'll, the, I'll, yeah. Maybe I'll ask for more, more genetic profile for this patient. And we do have, we test the PRACA in-house, Mohammed, right? We do the PRACA test in-house. Yes. Um, maybe we'll do the NGS for this patient and maybe things will change, but would I push for surgery? Yes, I'll do push for surgery, definitely. If you allow me, um, Mohammed, yeah, sorry, sorry, if you allow me, Mohammed, I have a, a small uh, comment and a question. And I direct my question actually to Mohammed al -Gherni. Um, So the comment is, uh, mashallah, shwag, well done. And this is definitely not a case that we, we're going to see day-to-day uh, -day practice for sure. Um, I do recall a similar case that Mohammed al -Gherni has treated recently, who, mashallah, got a complete response on... Uh, I can't remember if it's neoadjuvant chemotherapy, probably neoadjuvant chemotherapy for pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And Muhammad raises an excellent question, uh, point, and, 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 I, and I would like to ask him this question is, do you actually do genetic testing for everyone who comes with pancreatic cancer? And the reason being, do we want to catch those BRCA positive patients? And, you know, if you get a BRCA positive patient, then you would expect um, great sensitivity to platinum based chemotherapy. And hopefully you would, you would expect great responses, like the patient that you treated in Schwang's patient. Thank you very much, Kalan. So for uh, all comers now to our clinic, pancreatic cancer clinic, we do uh, a comprehensive uh, germline testing. And we have tested around 80 cases so far. And I can say that the rate of positive, uh, the, the positivity rate is around uh, seven to eight percent. And most of those who has pathogenic mutation, they have no family history of, of cancer. So uh, this also enhanced the idea that we should use uh, like uh, universal testing for all patient comers, regardless of their family history. Now back for the case that he responded nicely to chemotherapy. Actually, this patient, he came as locally advanced uh, unresectable pancreatic cancer. Uh, we did for him uh, the baseline uh, genomic, uh, sorry, comprehensive germline testing, and it showed that he has BRCA2 mutation and he has no family history of breast or ovarian cancer. So he started in full pyronox, he had five cycles and he has achieved CR based on, 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 uh, on that treatment. So. He had the Whipple surgery two weeks ago. He went home, He's on, he has uh, excellent recovery. So I'm planning to give him further a uh, few cycles of chemotherapy post, uh, post operative. But again, I think it's still uh, we, the germline testing or uh, BRCA testing has a value on those patients. I'm actually surprised, Mohammed. seven to 8%. That's, that's a lot, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And probably this, this patient responds because of the oxali. Right. Yes. Yeah. Platinum, which is which is great. Yeah. Yes. Great. Great questions. Okay. Do we have any more questions, Dr. Anafisa? Do you want to proceed with the second case? Yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You can go ahead, Dr. Mohammed. Yes. Right. Uh, so, second case. Um, like to uh, introduce you, my uh, dear friend and colleague, Dr. Anas Shemri, who's a GI and a sarcoma oncologist working at the National Guard who's gonna present for us a sarcoma case. And I'm sure it's gonna be interested because we have a sarcoma oncologist uh, in-house. Go ahead, Kana. Sure, let me just uh, share my screen. If you just give me one minute. Are you guys able to see my uh, PowerPoint? Yes. yes. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so thank you, Ashwag, Mohammed, Nafisa, and uh, Dr. Mohammed for 
introducing me and resuming the challenging uh, cases, uh, oncology case series. So I was asked to present a case in sarcoma. So, um, so here we go. So um, uh, this patient is a 59 year old woman who actually referred herself from another tertiary care hospital here uh, with basically metastatic uh, leiomyosarcoma. Initial disease dated back to 2018 when she was found to have a retroperitoneal mass plus liver uh, lesions, which were, which, um, were biopsied and came back as high-grade leiomyosarcoma. In November 2018, she was given uh, frontline doxorubicin and iphosphamide standard of care for four cycles, hoping to shrink disease to push her to surgery. However, she achieved stable disease as best response. After that, she went to Mayo Clinic. This was in uh, about February uh, 2019, uh, where she had the section of the mass uh, with a right uh, hepatectomy, right adrenalectomy, perihepatic IVC resection, uh, and reconstruction. So major, major surgery. Now, this was in February 2019. In April 2019, unfortunately, she had three new liver lesions. She was started on second line chemotherapy, which was gemcitabine and docetaxel. She had four cycles until September of 2019 with uh, partial response as the best response. Then she came back to Saudi Arabia. She had more gem, uh, gemcitabine and docetaxel followed by gemcitabine maintenance until she actually progressed. Then she was switched on third line pazopinib she ultimately developed progressive disease, and then she presented herself to our clinic. Past medical history is significant for hypertension dyslipidemia. She was on atorvastatin and lodipine. She had no known drug allergies, uh, and she was married and had five children. She was a housewife, no significant family history. Great thing when she presented is that her performance status was zero. So this is her baseline scan. So you can see a large liver lesion, multiple actually. And in her lungs, she actually has uh, significant masses. So the uh, baseline scan summary shows multiple hepatic lesions. One of them is in segment 4B, measures uh, approximately 10 by 8 centimeters. Another one was a diaphragmatic lesion. She also had bone lesions, left iliac bone. She also had uh, a muscular lesion in the aliosoas muscle. And she had multiple sized uh, metastatic pulmonary nodules and masses. So three initial challenges is that she progressed. So she had a soft tissue sarcoma, which is metastatic. She had radical surgery, but she uh, progressed after that immediately, indicating that this is a high-grade uh, lesion or high-grade disease. She also progressed on three uh, lines of systemic therapy in soft tissue sarcoma. Her disease burden is significant based on the large liver lesion, multiple lung lesions, plus bone mets. And she came to me with very high hopes that she was going to get cured. So our initial management in clinic is that we ordered trabectidin as non-formulary -form drug because it's not readily available. I have discussed with our pathologist to make sure that we're treating the same reported uh, disease uh, uh, from the outside pathology report. And he did that, uh, thankfully. And he did concur that this is a high-grade leiomyosarcoma. Plus, I requested that comprehensive genomic profiling gets done, which uh, was approved by our pathologist, thankfully. So comprehensive genomic profiling at National Guard Riyadh. So we have a few uh, readily available uh, 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 tests. One of them is our in-house assay. Uh, so we have tissue and we have liquid. Our tissue in-house comprehensive genomic profiling is limited for about 52 genes. It does test the most targetable genes that have FDA-approved drugs. Examples would be FGFR, KRAS, HER2, uh, ALK, EGFR, et cetera, and it's a valid test. We also have a specialized liquid biopsy, which has a more limited profile. It is mostly used for our non-small cell lung cancer, so Dr. Nafisa would uh, know this uh, best. It tests approximately 12 genes. Um, 
externally, so a more comprehensive panel that we readily use in our hospital would be the Foundation One uh, Comprehensive Genomic Profiling. It is a sent out test. It, is, uh, it does come with associated costs on the institution. Turnaround time would be less than three weeks. It tests uh, a large number of genes. It does need a significant, uh, so it does need tissue and it tests more than 300 genes. Now, there are other commercially available tests. However, you need to discuss this with pathology and get approval. And of course, at the expense of uh, cost, availability of tissue, and turnaround time. So next steps in management of this patient. So I explained to the patient that I do not think that we should wait until trebectidin arrives, nor until foundation, result, foundation one result is back. She agreed on this. Her performance status now was one. So I started her on single agent docarbazine, DTIC, at a dose of one gram per uh, meter square intravenously every three weeks. Now I, I chose one gram rather than 1.2 grams because of her heavily pretreated state and uh, abnormal bone marrow uh, or CBC uh, result. So she did tolerate it relatively well. She did suffer grade two nausea and vomiting, which improved after we improved her anti-emetic regimen. Otherwise her tolerance to chemotherapy was actually good. We did dental clearance and I started on denosumab uh, to, uh, uh, because, of the, because of her bone metastatic disease. So four, after four cycles of DTIC, um, we did a disease assessment CT scan and to my surprise, she actually had a partial response. Now, trebectidin did arrive, and comprehensive genomic profiling or foundation one uh, result did also arrive. So I discussed with the patient that since she actually had a partial response and her tolerance to chemotherapy after we maximized antiemetics was actually good, that we should continue, and she agreed on this. Currently, she is at cycle five, and she's actually doing quite well. So trebectidin um, is one of the unique chemotherapeutic agents, and this is one of the teaching points here, um, that we use in soft tissue sarcoma. It um, uh, induces P53 independent apoptosis and modulates tumor microenvironment. So in terms of FDA approval, it is FDA approved for uh, the L sarcomas, so liposarcoma and leiomyosarcoma, after progression on anthracycline containing regimen. Now our patient uh, progressed on uh, doxorubicin and ifosfamide. So uh, earlier on, there was a phase two study of trebectidin in patients with soft tissue sarcoma, and it showed a variable response rate of up to 17%. Median PFS, now this is a phase two only, was 1.9 months. And overall survival was close to one year with patients having L sarcomas. Now, when they looked retrospectively, they found that leiomyosarcomas and myxoid round cell liposarcomas had the greatest benefit. And hence this trial, which was done by George Dimitri and his colleagues. So uh, this was a phase three study. It was open label where uh, they randomized patients who progressed on anthracycline containing regimens and they had liposarcoma or leiomyosarcoma, two to one randomization to trebectidin or uh, the carbazine. Now, when we look at progression-free survival, it was statistically significantly pointing towards a benefit of trebectidin at 4.2 months compared to 1.5 months of the carbazine. Duration of response was also superior uh, favoring trebectidin and clinical benefit rate, so rate of shrinkage was up to 35% in the trebectidin group. And this was statistically significant. Um, now, PFS improvement was greatest in the myxoid uh, round cell liposarcoma, uh, uh, totaling 5.6 months versus 1.5 months uh, with regards to the carbazine. Uh, most commonest adverse event was actually myosuppression, myelosuppression and transient liver function test elevation. Now, this is the comprehensive genomic profiling or the foundation one profile that our patient had, microsatellite stable. TMB was six mutations per megabase. She also had a JAK3 mutation. Now, we do have a molecular tumor board that we have been doing for the last uh, nine months now at National Guard. 
where we get clinical oncologists, geneticists, molecular biologists, pathologists, and genomicists and bioinformatics collaborating together. The goal of having this molecular tumor board is to give the best evidence to aid the MRP or the physician with regards to clinical decision making. Um, so I mentioned this before. Uh, so we do have an international uh, FMI, so Foundation Medicine Molecular Tumor Board, where we get advice from external oncologists and genomicists, where we would discuss uh, the complicated or complex uh, Foundation One reports or compre comprehensive genomic profiling report. So we always would have an external physician and a genomicist who are experts in this, and they would give us their insights in terms of what would be the best uh, or the next best therapy based on the Foundation One report. So again, we started this initiative uh, uh, where we would conduct the molecular tumor board about nine months ago. Uh, we would discuss molecular and oncogenic pathways uh, that are complex with potential therapeutic targets. Then the discussion between oncologists uh, with regards to what are the best possible uh, therapies. Um, then we would uh, uh, move on uh, after discussing with the uh, uh, pathologist, uh, sorry, with the MRP uh, with regards to the best or the next best uh, therapies on the com comprehensive genomic profiling. So a suggestion based on this is that we should uh, try checkpoint inhibition. So molecular tumor boards or molecular profiling tumor boards have been done worldwide. Um, we have followed them now in National Guard. One of them is at Herbert Home Cancer Center, um, uh, where they have started up in approximately 2017, where they would do comprehensive genomic profiling on patients who failed multiple lines of therapy and have a good performance status, just like our patients. Um, in, in their case series where they presented or they reported about 50 cases, um, 12 of them uh, uh, basically uh, were matched to genomically matched therapy, and half of those were alive at one year after they actually uh, gave the therapies that was recommended by the Molecular Tumor Board. Another uh, huge uh, center uh, from the Moffitt Center in Florida they actually established their molecular tumor board earlier in 2014. They treated in their molecular tumor board more than uh, 1,400 patients. And they basically concluded after they reported this paper in 2017 that more patients were being offered to clinical trials and being enrolled into phase one clinical trials if they get presented in their in, in molecular tumor boards. Uh, again, this is, uh, so this is what we shown in our molecular tumor board, uh, we actually look at variant allele frequency and JAK3 uh, mutation was uh, the variant allele frequency was more than 60%. Uh, and we can see that TP53, so tumor suppressor gene, was found in 95% of the sample. So our, so I want you to briefly go over this. The discussion at our molecular tumor board is that JAK3 mutation does upregulate PDL1 expression. Uh, now, when this uh, happens, plus a TMB, if you remember, of six mutations per megabase, um, uh, the recommendation from the molecular tumor board is that we should try uh, immunotherapy in the form of pembrolizumab. So, just a final update on the patient. She is currently doing very well on the carbazine. I do suspect that she will progress very soon. I do not expect her to have a good response at the six uh, cycle uh, uh, scan. I do have two lines available after progression, after we presented her or, and did comprehensive general profiling. So we have trabectidin ready and we have pembrolizumab ready as well if she progresses. So educational points from and take home messages from this case. We went through very briefly the therapeutic sequencing of soft tissue sarcoma. So anthracycline early on, gemcitabine, docetaxel in the second line, pizopidib in third line in metastatic soft tissue sarcoma, and then investigator choice in fourth line and beyond. I went through the trabectidin evidence in, in soft tissue sarcoma, and I went through the concept, although it's simple, but I, I, want, to, um, I want to mention it here, is how to actually buy time when you don't have therapies available. So I use DTIC or the carbazine just to buy time until trabectidin was available. 
and to plan ahead by doing comprehensive genomic profiling. Because of the turnaround time, I, I bought uh, uh, more time by giving decarbazine until we get trebectidin available and until we have comprehensive genomic, genomic profiling result available. I mentioned the importance of comprehensive genomic profiling and how it actually gave us a therapeutic option in a soft tissue sarcoma case. And I went through the benefits of having a molecular tumor board. Um, and in the end, I'd like to welcome all of you to our Precision Oncology uh, Conference, which is happening in the end of August, which is going to be co-chaired by myself and Mohamed al garni and our monthly molecular tumor board, which we welcome any oncologist to uh, present their uh, complicated comprehensive genomic profiling cases uh, with us. They happen at the third Wednesday every month in the afternoon. I put my email here. If anyone is interested, they can email me and I can add their case to be discussed with us in our comprehensive genomic profiling or molecular tumor board. Thank you all. Thank you, Kanan. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Kanan. This is an amazing case. Actually, I'm very happy to see a sarcoma patient who can do very well on multiple lines of therapy. And still, we do have more options for him. Uh, you are approaching um, breast cancer now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nafisa. So it's always a challenge, and that's why I presented this case, is when we actually reach fourth line and beyond. So first, second, third lines, so anthracycline, doxoifos versus doxo alone, gem, cytobine, docetaxel, uh, followed by pizopinib are, I wouldn't say standard of care, but almost standard of care in your general soft tissue sarcomas. When we reach fourth line and beyond, it's always investigator choice. There are active agents with very modest benefit. One of them is DTIC, others are cyclophosphamide, etoposide, and others. So I'm actually interested to know how would Ashwag and Mohammed, because I know both of you treat sarcoma, how would you actually approach this at the fourth line? Because we do have a significant number of patients that actually approach fourth line, and you don't have strong response rate uh, therapies that you can give those patients. Um, Ashwag, you want to go ahead? Start, yeah, um, I, um, I like that you use decarbazine. We know this is one of the old chemotherapy. And I'm still a big believer of uh, decarbazine, even apart from the MADE protocol. And I know this um, being revived um, in synovial sarcoma on the protocols of the sandwich with the with uh, with the radiation on the new adjuvant or let's say conversion, uh, especially that we know synovial sarcoma is a hard to treat. Uh, I wouldn't use the carbazine, but this is very smart, very smart. Um, definitely ifosfamide and um, 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 anthracycline P is on the first line, Def uh, the same sequence, but um, maybe on the third and on the fourth line, even if I did not have an access for NGS, probably I'll try empiric uh, immunotherapy uh, of these patients if I have no, uh, no um, available drug. Um, I did this in a couple of patients and they seem stable. I know the data in soft tissue sarcoma is not greatest, but at least in immunotherapy, it's even better than uh, the bone related sarcoma. So I would do the same um, if I did not have the NGS, uh, which might help. Uh, and even the NGS came to be negative, which it's happened in a big number of cases of sarcoma. I would try pimple. Thank you so much, uh, much uh, Kenan, for this uh, very interesting case. And I uh, must say, you guys are doing a great job with the molecular tumor board. I must congrat all, uh, congratulate all of you for this great achievement and helping uh, these patients. Um, I would probably follow what you did. I'd probably just start with trebectidine trebe first. And also, I have the other options of erupulin, halibin. Uh, uh, it's a leomyosarcoma, so the, there is a chance of uh, improving improving the progression free survival based on the on the evidence. So it was similar design to what you have presented. But I would also check for the intrac pathway, and I'm sure you guys did it with the foundation one, right? Yes. Uh, yes. But probably this is what I would I would do. The, the carbazine is one of the options, uh, and um, and my sleep, uh, tabactidine. Erebulin, uh, same as what you did, Canaan. So this is uh, so you still have some options for this lady. 
I'm not sure about the immunotherapy. I'm not sure, I don't know, Ashwag, what's your experience with the immunotherapy in such cases, but um, even with the JAK mutation and you have the tumor burden mutation is low at six, I'm not sure if this is the right way to, 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 to go, but probably sometimes you're left with no other options. So if you have access, and you can always try and see and give the patient the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, I, I think we you can use it if you run off option. Um, some some people that don't have access for NGS and uh, your threshold should be low. Uh, yeah, um, like if you start the first CT scan and you did not see see progression, maybe I would withdraw the treatment as soon as possible. I wouldn't think about so the progression, these things on sarcoma because we don't we lack of evidence in these cases. Uh, but I have a good number of patients with sarcoma. One of them was Lyme sarcoma. He was around eighty, and I've tried everything in the textbook. And even I did an NGS and he was having one of the marker that can respond to Sutent. Uh, but he progressed on Sutent, even that uh, the uh, NGS was um, saying that the patient might respond, but he get PEMPRO almost like six or seven months with a stable disease with no toxicity. So it does work, but maybe we're missing the link because we are looking, we're going after um, the data of the um, high mutation burden of the patient have uh, overexpression of pd one and that is may not uh, the fact on uh, sarcoma. So I think sarcoma still we have the missing link and probably you know the data of having a um, massive profile of NGS on sarcoma, huge number of patients, around 1,600 patients, and they could not find really link, but we have a subtype of sarcoma that the link, like, um, you use uh, anti-angiogenesis on a patient with angiosarcomas and um, on um, uh, alveolar sarcoma, which is rare, we have a couple of target. But in general, I think Lyme uh, sarcoma, maybe to have sub several subtype that we're missing. I think the link on um, on sarcoma, it still, it still will, will appeal in the, in the future, like CC. I think in the future, we'll find more data. And an ASCO, probably two, uh, 2016, there were SARC-4. They were looking also on doing this, but we it's dead. They make um, initiative and data. Uh, there is a publication, but uh, we did not have a follow-up in the next ASCO, or they said after four years, they will have an, an, a presentation. But I think the data was not good enough to be presented again in the ASCO. Um, so I think maybe in the future, we will hear more about sarcoma, but again, it's a disease that you have limited option. Um, you have to play with whatever you have. And I, I think Kenan, what he did is brilliant. I lost you guys. Oops. No, you're with us. We, we see you and we hear you, Ashwag. Uh, but then I lost the screen. I cannot see anything. No, we can hear you and we can see you, Ashwag. All clear. So I we lost. Thank yeah. you, thank you, Ashwag. So I, I actually uh, concur with Ashwag um, with regards to um, not everyone probably, and you, Muhammad, not everyone benefits from immunotherapy in, in soft tissue sarcoma. I would probably be more generous to use it in certain subtypes such as uh, UPS, uh, such as alveolar soft part, where we actually have better evidence in terms of utility of uh, immunotherapy. Now, I think we have to actually focus on probably one of the things that we benefited here is, is the, the molecular tumor board, where um, uh, any discussion with foundation one experts, and I, I, I did not know that JAK3 mutation actually uh, upregulates PDL1 and makes um, tumors more sensitive to immunotherapy. Um, and I think this is, this is the um, benefit of uh, joining experts in, in molecular tumor boards where we actually can share ideas, uh, specifically in such cases where performance status is great, patient can withstand further therapy, and we actually need to think about um, better genomically profiled or uh, precision or personalized uh, uh, medicine approaches um, uh, based on comprehensive genomic profiling. So, so I, I think this is one of the uh, major uh, educational points that I, I wanted to point out in, in this uh, case. Absolutely, Karan. This is uh, this is great. 
and uh, we'll be ha happy actually to attend with you guys sometime to learn from you. Um, can I have a question here uh, as a sarcoma specialist? Uh, please tell us how do you use ivosomide and what dose and frequency and all regimen. I think they're talking about aim made. Yeah. Days, yeah, yeah. three days dose. Yes. 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 So I typically in our hospital we use the we divide the dose over three days. And there are different dosing protocols. If you actually look it up, you're going to find multiple different dosages. Um, so the one I use is 75 milligrams per meter square of doxorubicin day one. And you actually can divide it up over, over three days. So 25, 25, 25. And the iphosphamide, the total dose is approximately six grams. So two gram, two gram, two gram. But then you can use a range between five to probably up to 7.5 grams. Uh, over over the three days, so that's that's how I would use it. Yes, exactly. Uh, what I do actually, um, so I do the twenty five for the first day, uh, three days with the doxo, and I do eighteen hundred ibuprofen for four days. Oh, over four days. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kanan, for this great case, uh, Doctor Nafisa. Thank you, Kanan. Congratulations on that case. And I think we're going to move forward. And the third case for today is um, another case from Ashwag, but this time about colon cancer. So the, I think we lost Ashwag. No, no. I'm, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Please, oh, OK. Can you see my slides? Yes, they are very clear. Yes. Uh, I, ch I, I changed the laptop. I think the other one dead. Um, so I'm sorry for that. Um, so we'll uh, switch gear. We'll talk about another challenging cases, which is uh, colorectal cancer. Um, this is an 85-year-old presented to the ER uh, for a couple of days with history of lower abdominal pain and perineum maturation. Initially thought to have a UTI, started an antibiotic, but she continued uh, to complain and CT scan was done. You can see in the CT scan how much her bowel is dilated, and on the cecum, you can see there is a huge mass there. So she, she was presenting with obstruction, and uh, she went to laparotomy. They did for her a total proctocolectomy and end ileostomy, found to have two cancers, one on the right side and one on the rectum. Uh, it was moderately differentiated, um, mucinous adenocarcinoma, part in the rectum and part, uh, part in the cecum, full thickness. So uh, the pathology and molecular, it was T3 and 0 M, uh, MX and on the rectum and also T3 N2 on the right colon. MSI1, unstable, rash mutated. So the data for MSI was not uh, there when we saw the patient. So the patient had a long post-op recovery We've discussed her in the tumor board and we repeat the CT scan at that time. And we found that she had a really metastatic disease. We can see there is a mass here uh, close to her um, left kidney. And again, there is in the subcutaneous tissue, a huge mass, which indicate um, a disease, um, metastatic disease. So in April, 2019, I started her in Zillow, the single agent, pays on her age, was not tolerated Zillox. Um, and because of what's happened in her post-operative um, course, she got a total of five, five cycles of oral zeloda, and unfortunately, she progressed. Based on the molecular uh, profile, I start her in PIMPO. She had the first four cycles, show stable disease. Then after cycle eight, she had progression of uh, disease. I repeat the scan, uh, two scan um, uh, with uh, one month apart, and still show disease progression. So patient was off therapy, we ordered a graphenib, it was non formulary And during the COVID outbreak, she stayed off five months of therapy. When she came to me, I decided to repeat her scan. And you can see there is no lesion on the subcutaneous. And all, uh, sorry, here, no lesion around the kidney. And in the other scan, the lesion and the subcutaneous tissue totally um, resolved. So the new CT scan show complete response, although, although the patient was off therapy for five months. Patient who resisted tumor in um, Bempro, no toxicity. She have total of 16 cycle, seen last June, 2021, and there is no residual disease. 
So what's the learning point from uh, this patient? Synchronous tumor, what does it indicate? So the prognosis of synchronous tumor in a patient with colorectal cancer, it's carry a very poor a prognosis. And um, that's um, found in, uh, on, the, uh, on all the clinical trials. It's around um, uh, 10 months on these patients. And given the fact that our patient is elderly and um, having a lot of um, um, comorbidity, we think uh, this patient even will carry more poor prognosis and having the fact it's right-sided, mucinous, again, it's, it's, ma it's, it's make it a very bad disease. So do we see complete response after stopping um, immunotherapy? Yes, we do, but after progression, I looked for the GI malignancy, I found uh, one case that it's real, have a real progression, uh, but they call it in the, in the, the case report, a pseudoprogression in a patient with metastatic squamous carcinoma of the bladder. The patient was off therapy for around um, six or seven months and the disease disappeared. And this is another case of upper GI malignancy of gastroesophageal tumor that does have her progression and after stopping immunotherapy, she went into a complete response. Third uh, learning point, how to distinguish between pseudo progression and a real progression. This is um, talking about the phenomenon of pseudo progression on a patient who treated with immunotherapy. It's due to a lot of, we know a lot of transient immunocell infiltrate within the tumor that give the false uh, negative of a progression. But in the um, uh, immunorelated uh, research criteria, confer the, to confirm a progression, you should have two scan four weeks apart, in addition of a new lesion uh, of her total uh, tumor um, volume. Treatment beyond recess progression, it showed that it can reduce the tumor 15% on melanoma case and 13% in a patient with renal cell cancer. But there is no data about GI malignancy and a lot of discussion with um, GI oncologists who've been treated patients with immunotherapy there would not be a believer that pseudo progression can happen in GI malignancy like, like in melanoma, RCC, and lung cancer. But in fact, this case proving um, a different concept. And again, um, the hyper progression that we see. I haven't seen it in GI malignancy, but we see hyper progression on HCC a lot. A third, a uh, fourth learning point. What is the rule of immunotherapy on metastatic renal, uh, uh, sorry, um, colorectal cancer? So we know the data of nivolumab in a patient with microsatellite and stable on the check, uh, checkmate 142. And this is uh, the data of having nivolumab as a single agent, progression-free survival at 18 months and 12 months was 44. And uh, the overall survival did not reach. When they add a uh, to the treatment, uh, it adds also more value in terms of progression free survival and overall survival. And you can see the separation of the curve between the dual treatment and also um, the, uh, between the uh, dual treatment compared to a single therapy with um, nivolumab. And this is um, the data that I think changed um, the way how we treat colon cancer and MSI high patient, uh, the keynote 177. Um, this is um, a clinical trial as a first line therapy patient with microsatellite and stable. They will treat it either with PEMPRO compared with chemotherapy. And again, you can see the difference at, at 36 months 42% from PIMPRO compared to 11% to the chemotherapy. And this is also looking at uh, the progression-free survival. Um, again, um, it show also a different at 36 months, 60 compared to almost 40% to the chemotherapy. An overall survival at 36 months was 61 compared to 50 on uh, uh, PIMPRO compared to chemotherapy. And uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shwag. That's a very interesting case. And really, uh, we are now having so many options in colorectal cancer. And those who treat colorectal cancer nowadays, they're acting like a breast oncologist. 
with oh. all due respect to Victoria <laughs> and Pisa. So we have so many options too. Um, yeah, so like uh, yeah, very interesting. Um, so let's open the floor for discussion. I'd like to hear from you, Kenan. Um, would you do something different? Would you do the same? So I, I concur with Dr. Ashwag, and I also concur that immunotherapy is actually here to probably change the therapy of colorectal cancer. And there is developing uh, evidence now, in, even in the new adjuvant setting in, in rectal cancer, that it may actually give us better outcomes. Um, there may be less toxicity with um, uh, immunotherapy. You still would get, you know, the serious adverse uh, events that can be life-threatening. However, they they can occur in less than 5%, but they do not have the same toxicity profile as with cytotoxic chemotherapy. With MSI high tumors, now standard of care is actually first-line immunotherapy, which um, uh, I think most of GI oncologists now have seen MSI high patients in the metastatic setting and have given them immunotherapy with hopefully some good responses. I know Schwag has some, Hamid al Garni has some, and I have a couple of cases now. Um, so I think immunotherapy is here to uh, change uh, the therapy or the therapeutic uh, uh, paradigm of colorectal cancer. And I think we all, that we will get some newer evidence with newer combination. I think uh, one of the newer uh, combinations that were exciting was uh, anti-EGFR with immunotherapy. I think cetuximab with I think a TISO or a Velumab, I can't remember, but we are getting those unique combinations coming up as well. Let me ask you guys about uh, the pseudo progression. Have you seen any pseudo progression on GI malignancy? Let's not upper GI, let's say colorectal. Have you seen a pseudo progression? So I, I haven't seen it in colorectal. I actually, unfortunately, saw hyper progression where the patient actually progressed very rapidly after one cycle and uh, unfortunately did not do well. But I have not seen in, in, uh, in colorectal. I'm sure Nafisa would have definitely seen in, in lung cancer because it's, I, I do believe it's more common in, in non-small so cells. They kept on saying pseudoprogression, pseudoprogression, but it's really, it's his real progression. The incidence of pseudoprogression even is very small in the lung. It's not that, it's not like what they are talking about. Um, mm. The idea came from melanoma cases, and in the melanoma, we, we do, we, they did uh, see uh, cases of pseudoprogression, but in the lung, it's very rare, maybe 4% or less. And when the, our patient progress, the, yes, it is, it is a real progression. We used to keep patients on the same medication for a while, just for bridging, when you are waiting for a new line or you are waiting for a re medication after finding a new mutation, for example especially if the patient is not symptomatic, but he is progressing uh, radiologically, uh, I do keep patients on two, three cycles of the same regimen. But uh, most of the time, it is a serial progression. And, and I, the same like you, I did see uh, many um, hyperprogression. Mm. Uh, sometimes pseudoprogression actually can reflect on the patient's status. So I've seen actually a pseudoprogression in a two RCC cases. Um, so they progressed on images, but clinically they really do well. And then the second scan, they have some response and a stable disease. They don't have really a complete response. Last one is a 38-year-old with the massive RCC with the lung mets, and he was not able even to eat. So I uh, started them on epi and and evil four cycles and uh, the first scan showed a huge disease progression but clinically he was up and about he was eating then i carried on with a single agent nevo and i repeated scan he's actually responding so i've seen it in rcc but not in calling cancer and the other thing i would also uh concur with the uh, canaan so if you look at the data yes actually the msi high they don't respond very well to chemotherapy uh, in fact, the response rate was higher with the immunotherapy. What I'm really interested in is seeing a combination between a chemotherapy and immunotherapy and the setting of MSI uh, colorectal cancer. And I wish if we can see the, these um, some results of, of this. And probably, uh, Kanan, when you said um, uh, cetuximab, it's probably with abilumab. It's the same company. So yes. they, want, they want to promote uh, their... I just have uh, uh, one uh, comment since we have a good number of uh, attendees. It's, a, it's a more of education and rather than uh, a comment. So uh, whenever you approach someone with the microsatellite and a stable uh, tumor, especially in the colorectal cancer, you have always to, to, to screen for the germline uh, mutation. 
I know this patient is elderly and mostly maybe it's just sporadic, but having synchronous tumor with MSI high tumor, it's worth at least starting with testing for PRF mutation, because if there is, there is a PRF mutation, this means that you are dealing with, with uh, somatic or sporadic uh, colorectal cancer. But if it's wild type, it's, it, you have to do the germline testing uh, because this has an importance and impact on the patient uh, family. So always consider uh, screening for Lynch syndrome for those patients. Thank you so much, Mohammed. I have two questions for you, Ashwag, from the audience. Okay. So the first one, in a stage four colorectal cancer with the MSI high, at the same, at the same time, Keras mutant, um, positive too, how would you start in an ideal world? I think the data in the, um, um, on the subgroup analysis show that the patient with Keras, they do, don't, don't do well as the wild type. So I think, no. I'll still give the patient, unless we have um, clear data testing these patients specifically with immunotherapy. Um, I think immunotherapy is still, uh, there's a lot of patients with Keras mutant and our patient was Keras mutant and she did have a complete response with immunotherapy. So still, I'm gonna give um, immunotherapy. And I know the data is conflicting. It's making um, a lot of debate. And um, I have a meeting with one of, um, one of the oncologists, I'm not sure if he's from UK, and he was treating a lot of colorectal cancer, and he was one of the PI on the Keynote 177. And again, um, he, this, this question came up, and um, he concurred that these patients still you need to treat them with, uh, with uh, immunotherapy. And unless we have this subgroup being treated in prospective uh, way, maybe sub a uh, group of the KRAS mutant may not respond, uh, but I don't think all the KRAS mutants, uh, um, they are uh, resistant to immunotherapy. And this is always, and this is for the attendees. This is a joke about medical oncologists. If you have a positive result, they're gonna go and look for any negative outcome from the subgroup analysis. And if you have a negative result, they're gonna go and look for any positive uh, result from the subgroup analysis. And I agree with you, Ashwag. This is this is the KRAS uh, status was not pre-specified when they run the trial, so we cannot really draw any conclusion from this. Uh, exactly as you said, if we have a pre-planned uh, analysis to check for the RAS mutant and the response at that time, yes, I would I would agree with you. And if it's negative, no one is going to use it. So the second question, Ashwag. Is, um, is there any role of uh, PDL1 testing in colorectal cancer? I don't think we have any data about that. Um, it is in the GI malignancy, upper GI malignancy, uh, if you have PDL1 positive. Um, but I don't think it's, uh, we have any data to say that we have to test that. So I think in Maasai, because it was the initial one that have the cap or the cover for all malignancy, if you have a Maasai high, you treat. Uh, but um, I don't think we have data that um, expression of PDL1 will affect uh, the treatment of the immunotherapy like in lung cancer. But it's very interesting that uh, why PDL1 data not available in colorectal cancer or doesn't have much attention. It's, it's, it's worth asking because, you know, uh, we have MSI, uh, we know it's agnostic uh, marker, but PDL1 have been tested in each tumor. But for colon cancer, you don't find this information. It's very interesting. That is why, that is why I think we, we, we always saying that PDL1 is not the only um, uh, marker that saying this patient will respond. Definitely, there are uh, other factors that play a major role in that. Tumor mutational burden, CPS yes. score and upper yes. GI malignancies, PDL1 expression, MSI high. I think different biomarkers are probably being marketed for different diseases. I think this Absolutely. is probably what's, what's, what's happening now. And let me ask you guys, since you guys have access to the NGS, do you get PDL1 tests on colorectal cancer? They do it? In they NGS? Do it? Yes. But like Foundation One, have you ever seen a report with the PDL1 uh, got tested? I don't know. I tested one patient, CRC, but I don't think I said uh, BDL1 was there. It's immune histochemistry test, usually. They don't do it the same with the NGS. You're the expert in BDL1. <laughs> yeah. And probably, the, the, and I agree with you guys because there is no uh, standard for colorectal cancer. Is it BDL1 TPS or TPS or 
No one knows, right? Yes. Great question. Okay. Um, yes. One question, last question. Okay. One of you, I, I'm not sure, Kanan or, or Ashwag mentioned that they start using new therapy with um, rectal cancer. Maybe. Was it combined with radiation? I think it was with Folfox, right? Was it with Folfox combined with chemo? Oh no, chemo versus PIMPRO, right? Can I? Oh, actually, can I mention the, um, the rectal cancer data with I, I, Yes, I heard it. Um, I think it's PIMPRO versus chemo with radiation. So can I? Well, I don't recall, but I know now that there is a phase phase two study that is being done at different centers that is actually uh, testing uh, neoadjuvantly uh, uh, immunotherapy plus chemotherapy in rectal cancers, uh -huh. um, which is very interesting. And I think if, if this provides a better objective response rate, we always look for pathological CR in rectal cancer. I mean, it has implications prognostically and it has implications surgically because if you actually get a CR, then you may actually save the patient from uh, uh, a surgical resection. And there is evidence for this. So I, I think this um, trial, it's still a phase two trial, but being trialed at uh, a French center, a Lebanese center and a US center. If it actually brings out a decent result, I think it, it will probably expand it to a phase three. I, I want to visit these centers. <laughs> I want to just. <laughs> I think I think Mohammed. Yeah, what we learned from this is we need to advocate uh, uh, starting investigator initiated trials in our region. Absolutely. I think probably this is the way. This is the way to go. Absolutely. So regarding the new adjuvant, actually for patient with rectal cancer, there is uh, already a study done in in uh, Dutch group. And they examine the role of combining uh, ipilimumab and nivolumab in patient with MSI high tumor in the new adjuvant setting. And based on the very excellent result that they have, as most of those patients who underwent surgical resection, they already achieved CR. So they are moving it to a phase three study. So for MSI high tumor, I think uh, rectal cancer, I think if we can uh, offer them new adjuvant therapy without the, uh, you know, the complication of having APR or permanent stoma, it's, it's a really a very good choice for, for those patients. Absolutely. Watchful waiting. Opera trial, as you mentioned, Kanan. Excellent. Dr. Nafisa, I think uh, no more questions. Yeah, no more questions. I think we're going to move to the last um, challenging case for today. It will be another case from... Uh, no more cases, yeah, no, no more cases. No, no, no more cases. No. I Okay, uh, thank, yeah, you nice for, Nafisa, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you for uh, these amazing yeah, cases, and thank you, uh, Mohammed and Nafisa, for uh, excellent uh, moderation. We enjoyed it a lot, and we hope to see you tomorrow at the same time for another three interesting cases, and Nafisa, not four. <laughs> thank you. I'm not. <laughs> thank you so much for having me, guys. Thank you to our attendees. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you.